Welcome to the OUC Talk Show. Our goal with this show is to introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, we're, we're more than happy to, to talk to you today. Mm -hmm. So I want to start with a fun question. What is the probability that the sun will rise tomorrow? One. <laughs> Tell us more about why that, why that answer actually made you feel, uh, you know, funny. Because it will rise tomorrow. But how do you know that? Because we can see it every day. <laughs> Have you heard of the, 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 uh, the Laplace, uh, like, sunrise problem? That yes. <laughs> like, what does that make you think about the, the Bayesian theorem of, of how you know, like you like to do a lot of like Bayesian, uh, like probability. Like, what is the, like, what do you think of the problem and of how we can use Bayesian methods in order to evaluate such questions that we may not necessarily know the probability of? Yeah, of course, because you know, you you want to have, uh, you want to update your information. Really, I mean, you you have some uh, data today, but then you will have some data tomorrow. So every time you have a new observation, you can use that, those observations to update uh, what you knew yesterday that you want to update today. So you have a prior information. And then uh, the idea is to use that prior information to make that update. So then, you know, we have a prior information that we, uh, you know, we, we have uh, data on, uh, well, in this case, it's just our, uh, our own experience that, uh, you know, we, we, we know that the sun will, will, will rise tomorrow. So then, uh, you know, we can update it, but, you know, after you update it, uh, you know, you will have uh, some kind of convergence. Uh, so then you, you will have a better estimation every time you have a new data and, uh, and uh, you update your previous information. So then the idea is to always use your prior information to get a posterior information that will be updated uh, just using uh, a law that is going to be uh, the probability law, how things uh, work, or how do you know uh, the, uh, the nature works. And then you uh, use that information uh, to update uh, uh, what's going to happen. What do you grew up doing when you were back in Caracas? What do you grew up doing that led you to do what you're doing now? Well, I, I, I started as a mathematician, so I was using, I was studying math, uh, and then I came up with, uh, I, I met uh, some very interesting people, you know, like it's always, there is always somebody in your youth that is going to be a, a, a high influence, a, a very highly influential uh, model or character. So then I, I happened to meet a uh, professor Ignacio Rodriguez Iturbe, who, who was uh, a professor at Princeton and, and for many years also a professor in, in Texas A&M, but he was my professor when I was a, a young student. And I, I happened to have a, you know, we, we had these classes called, called um, supplementary classes, courses. So uh, in my case, I took uh, stochast stochastic hydrology as a, as a supplementary class. So, you know, I was really concentrated in my, in my classes uh, on testing theorems and testing or, or, you know, just working very theoretical problems and, and, and doing a lot of uh, limas and corollary and theorems and, and proofs. And then I, you know, just decided, oh, maybe I should do something else. So <laughs> then I went to take this class and uh, Professor uh, Rodriguez Iturbe was the professor of that class. And I said, wow, is this all you can do with probability and math? Uh, so then, you know, all these beautiful real world problems, you know, uh, you know looking at how rainfall behaves, you know, like uh, uh, all this variability, how you can uh, quantify that uncertainty how you can put, uh, you know, just have these uh, probabilistic models to, to understand uh, this uh, shifting 
uh, from location to location are this, this intermittency that you see in rainfall, especially in the tropics, you know, like perhaps, uh, you know, here in the southern or, or, or more northern latitudes where you don't have these uh, tropical uh, conditions and you don't have this seasonality, then you, do, you cannot feel it. But, you know, for us, uh, having a dry, wet, uh, and intermittent, intermittency conditions all the time, you know, it was uh, something that interests me very much. And then I say, oh, well, maybe I should do something else. So then I'll, I'll try to put a little bit more my eye in stats and, and probability and models, uh, and probabilistic models just to, to, to uh, have another vision of the world. I mean, it's not that I, 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 I enjoy the theoretical part, and I, I, I do enjoy it very much, but it, I also thought it was very much um, a lot of fun to, to, to deal with real problems. And then from there, I decided, well, this is what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. So that's why I, I just took that path. Um. Sorry. Any, any experience, what did you think was the most rewarding studying statistics and probability? Because I know it's, it's something mm -hmm. many people um, dread. Um, they, don't, they might not enjoy studying probability, but what was something that you found to be the most rewarding for you? Well, you know, the most rewarding for, uh, is, uh, was, for example, uh, trying to uh, talk to different people. I mean, it's the, it's the, the multidisciplinary nature of of being a statistician or I'm working in this kind of problems is because you have to learn uh, from other fields. For example, you know, I started to work in, uh, you know, in, in stochastic models for, for uh, simulating weather data. Uh, so I had to, to learn a lot of the physics, you know, of, of the weather. And, and then uh, I, I, I went on to do applications for uh, crop modeling and how uh, stochastic the stochasticity inherent in the in the weather data affects uh, crop growth and and, 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 and yield and, and you know corn yield or <laughs> whatever soybean yield. So uh, so uh, for me it was very rewarding to be able to use math and stats and probability to be able to apply that to a very important problem that was to be able to say, okay, uh, how much uncertainty you will have, uh, a, you know, with the weather in a particular location and how would that affect, uh, for example, crop yield or uh, an important crop where people, you know, that is, is this just sustainable or, uh, uh, or, or just, you know, food that people needs <laughs> For, for their uh, livelihoods. So then, you know, that was a, uh, the first rewarding experience because that was my f uh, like one of my first topics that I worked uh, with uh, when I was uh, starting my, my graduate degree. And, and then, of course, after that, many, many other applications. Uh, every time you uh, uh, get into a new application or a new area, then you have to learn from that from that topic because otherwise you don't understand anything what's going on. So you need to understand the physical processes as well. It's not only having the data and just crunching the data and then just, you know, because you have a bad quality here. So, you know, if something in the input is just having not the right thing or, or just it's just not having the right quality, well, the output isn't going to have a good quality either. So. So then you, uh, you really need to understand the, the physical processes behind. And, and then talking with many uh, experts in different fields, then you also learn uh, from all these other uh, fields. And, and, and uh, that's the multidisciplinary richness of uh, statistics. Mm -hmm. And especially learning, because you really have to learn a lot about the specific fields in order to make an accurate prediction or an accurate model. Mm -hmm. And something that I really find interesting is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there were many people who said, like Voltaire, he, I remember, if I remember correctly, he said that, you know, uncertainty is uncomfortable and certainty is absurd. And I'm really interested in, in, in hearing your thoughts about 
how do you think about uncertainty, not only when you're making these models and, and really like when, when you're working on these problems, how do you think about uncertainty in those cases, but also in general, in life, because especially a young person's like life today is very uncertain because of the technology, because of many things, and whatever, like whatever you got, maybe climate change as well. Uncertainty, how do you think of that? Well, you know, the, uh, the, every, every time we, we have to make a decision, of course, we have to deal with uncertainty. And our lives is basically, uh, we have to make a decision from, from the very early morning that we wake up, you know, what we are going to do next. And then, of course, we have some routines, but sometimes we just have to take decisions uh, with very little information. So then uncertainty means uh, that you, you have to be able to use whatever you have, whatever information you have at hand to be able to make a, a decision about uh, a problem and try to make the best decision. So then how you, do you use that information is the key part. Okay, so then uh, of course you, 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 ha you might know uh, some uh, behavior of your system, okay? You might know how a system works and you have a model for that uh, system uh, or the functioning of that system. But again, you know, you need information. So then the, the key issue here is that to be able to get informed uh, with uh, uh, information and then of course information is not data I mean data is there but you know we, we need to get information from data and and then it's not the same thing so then uh, uh, in order to get information you need to have this data uh, in your hand and then look at different uh, aspects of the data so then you have to uh, sometimes handle the data uh, manage the data, look at graphics, look at uh, numbers, what these numbers are telling you, and then uh, based on that, then you take a decision. But if you are not taking, I mean, you, if you don't have this information, which is coming from raw data, uh, and then after processing this raw data is where you are going to have the, this information, then is when you can take a decision that is called informed. So then the, the idea is to always try to get uh, informed decisions uh, in order to be able to minimize your uncertainty. Well, what about the cases where you cannot acquire more information on the data? How, how would you deal with that? Mm, well, you know, the, yeah, this is, uh, in fact, we, we were talking about that today with uh, uh, one of my previous former students that uh, she was asking me more or less the same question she said if she was talking about the, uh, some solar panel information they needed to uh, predict uh, energy consumption and they only had information on a monthly basis but they needed the information on a daily basis. So then, uh, you know, how do you do if you don't have the right information or you have too little information? Okay, but you know, you always have of course, uh, other resources, like for example, you might know how uh, energy production from these solar panels is going to be because you probably have a, a, a model or a formula uh, that uh, tells you how the system works. And then uh, you can always do some kind of, uh, or just uh, assume that you have a, uh, and a statistical model that you can calibrate somehow and you can, your parameters can be estimated from this very raw or unappropriate information or unappropriate data. And then uh, you can always do things like simulation. Okay, so then you can simulate from your uh, statistical model that you are going to be using trying to emulate this system that you don't know. So then Sometimes you call, you talk about emulators, okay? So emulators would be uh, some kind of a stochastic process that is going to emulate a physical process uh, for which you might have some uh, different kind of model that is not necessarily a statistical model, but it's a physical model that uh, is going to be available because, you know, uh, normally for many different uh, physical processes, you know the loss, the physical loss. 
Okay, but one thing is the physical law, and then the other thing is how the randomness plays a role in that physical system. Okay, so then uh, one way to incorporate that, uh, that uncertainty and that randomness is to use an emulator, like a, uh, it's, it's going to be a statistical model that is going to uh, capture this uh, physical behavior of your uh, physical system, and then uh, you are going to include some uh, randomness because you have this probabilistic model that is uh, trying to emulate the physical system. So then you can use simulation, you can uh, uh, use uh, part, part of your data, if, even if it's just a portion of the data you need, but you can always uh, have some information and, and produce uh, some uh, emulation of the system. So I like the word emulation because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's resembling uh, a physical system that might be very complex, okay, and maybe you don't have all the information about that system, but you always can have uh, uh, a, a stochastic model that could resemble what the physical system is, is, is still uh, telling you or the behavior of that system. Well, it's like good enough that you can use it to make predictions, but obviously you know it's not perfect because how can you model something with all the variables is almost insanely possible and also computationally quote unquote impossible. If you were to do a city, state, national, or even worldwide survey, what would you want to learn? You mean new or something new? You mean? Uh, I mean, I mean, like if you were to do a, uh -huh. you know, you are a person who oh. loves statistics. So if oh. you were to do a survey. Oh, okay, a survey in general. Yeah. So to you, the population or whatever you want, maybe okay. a city, state, mm -hmm. country, state, mm -hmm. or even mm -hmm. worldwide. Mm -hmm. What are you curious about? Like, what would you want to know more about? Uh, yeah, I, one of my latest favorite topics and uh, very challenging is to be able to understand how, uh, uh, how risk is distributed in time and space uh, as a consequence of, for example, extreme events. I mean, if you have a, a tornado or uh, you have a winter storm or you have a flood. Uh, so I'm really fascinated with uh, the, uh, the process of understanding how risk uh, distributed is distributed are, 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 are along different scales and uh, in time and space because you know it's, it's just a temp it's, it's a spatial temporal process. So um, I'm fascinating about that, and uh, you know if I if I had the possibility to do a survey, as you say, uh, I would try to uh, gather all the possible information on how. Uh, risk is behaving, and risk has many components. So, for example, uh, you know, if you if you have uh, a storm here, and then uh, in Champaign, for example, and then uh, some people or some structures or some areas are damaged, and and others are not. You know, why is that? Okay, so for example, in in a location where you have a lot of disparities. Uh, socially or economically, uh, you might have a different response and a different result on the damage of uh, those extreme events on the population or on the location. So then that, uh, 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 I would say, interaction, that very rich interaction between the hazard, you know, these extreme events, uh, what is exposed, and what is the outcome of these losses that you might have because of these events, okay? And, and then how you would uh, quantify the risk that you are exposed to uh, because of the hazards. And so th this is my, one of my latest favorite, favorite topics, and I, I'm uh, always trying to learn a little bit more about that. So this is what I would try to do. So I will try to ga gather as much as information as possible to understand and, and potentially model 
this uh, special temporal, very complex uh, process about risk to extreme events, especially uh, hydrometeorological events, you know, anything related with extreme weather or, or uh, the different processes associated to that. Mm -hmm. You know, are those risks fatal? Or, or like, how do you think about the risk in those situations? Well, I, I you know, so uh, there are many ways you can uh, uh, define that, but the way I, I normally uh, see it is uh, trying to understand what are your, what are the expected losses that you might have and, and, you know, expected losses means that uh, you have uh, some exposure, you know, you have population living there, you have uh, assets, you have uh, infrastructure, uh, you have, uh, for example, think about the coastal areas. You know, the coastal areas are, are a very complex uh, uh, portion of the, of the urban system because, you know, everybody loves to live uh, by the sea. You know, and, and now we have, uh, you know, big storms and sea level rise uh, because of uh, a potential climate change. And, uh, you know, we have uh, in many locations, we have, uh, you know, poor areas where people live close to the sea because they like it. <laughs> and then well, we also have uh, very rich areas where people like to live in the sea because, they, you know, they have all the uh, facilities and, and uh uh, very nice uh, locations because, you know, the sea is very nice. But then, uh, you know, how you uh, measure that? I mean, how you uh, measure uh, w what are the expected losses that uh, you will encounter in a particular location and time uh, because a hazard event, a hazardous event might happen. Uh, at a certain point. So then how, you, how do you measure that? It's, it's, a, it's a complex problem because you have to take into account many, many different interactions. So, you know, maybe now we are, uh, are going to be um, able to use some kind of hybrid modeling where we use some uh, machine learning methods uh, combined with some uh, statistical methods and uh, uh, maybe uh, g come up with a better answer because there are, I mean, the relationships are going to be very nonlinear. And uh, uh, there is not a physical model there that is going to tell you everything. Uh, so you will have different compartments. Uh, so maybe you have a good physical model to tell you, okay, uh, how the uh, uh, sea level or waves are going to be uh, behaving in this particular area, so you might have a very nice physical model about that. But then, uh, what is the interplay? I mean, what 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 the people is going to do? For example, think about this this big uh, volcano that uh, uh, we had just recently in the Pacific, and then how the waves are or the impacts of the of the waves went to uh, California, Santa Cruz, and then. Uh, you know, uh, all the damages there, how people reacted, and, and why did, did that happen? I mean, uh, how some people was uh, more aware of that and then, you know, protected themselves and others maybe not. So this is something also that is interesting uh, because you need to have some kind of preparedness. Uh, and then, uh, uh, for example, in, in some areas, uh, people is not really aware of that. There is a very, very little preparedness uh, on, on this kind of events and their impacts. Uh, so then that is another variable you have to consider. Okay, so then uh, how much is the, I mean, what is the level of preparedness of the population? So one thing that comes to mind is statistics at the end of the day are numbers on a paper, but the application is in terms of like real lives with real people. So, um, I, like today, we, we like our population is plagued with misinformation, and that is something a lot of us struggle overcoming or identifying. So, in your in your experience as a statistician, um, have you uh, worked with communities where it was hard to convince that there was there was a risk pertaining, uh, like um, something in the future coming that they were in a danger of, but they weren't convinced just because. There were, there were just numbers on a paper and you couldn't just prove it to them? Uh, that's a great question because, you know, that uh, I actually had 
that particular experience because uh, in, in, in Venezuela, in, in 1999, we had a big flood. Uh, so we call it the, the uh, Vargas tragedy because uh, it was a very, very big event. You know, we had uh, uh, many, many, many days of uh, continuous rainfall. And between 14 and 15 of December of 1999, uh, there was a, a big uh, event in the coastal area where many uh, uh, poor people was living uh, very close to the little creeks. And all these creeks uh, just rose and, and, and everything was just washed out. So, uh, uh, and then we had uh, many, many uh, losses uh, and, 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 and the amount of, uh, of uh, economic destruction was amazing. So then uh, we tried many years later uh, to work with the communities there. So we were having some, uh, we were trying to implement uh, something called uh, early warning system, community-based early warning system. So a community-based early warning system was uh, basically a, a warning system in where you really try, try to integrate the local population. So then first of all, you need to, to uh, train that population, uh, that community, okay, so what they would expect. Okay, so that happened in 1999. And, and then uh, we, were tr uh, we had another event in 2005, which was a little bit uh, smaller, but still uh, important. And we were, I remember that we were working in 2010, and in 2010, we also had another event. And uh, you know, I remember that uh, popula I mean, the community there, when we were uh, just giving the, uh, we were talking to them, we, we had these workshops and, and, and uh, uh, these conversations you know, with the, with the uh, community leaders. Uh, that were uh, living in, the, in those areas. And, uh, you know, when we were uh, telling them, look, uh, these events can happen again. You know, uh, I mean, they have a return period. Also, uh, in, in, uh, on average, you know, uh, the event that happened uh, was uh, maybe 200 year return period. It means that on average, it could happen every 200 years, but that was not really the case because when you, if you do a, a, a better analysis and use, for example, Bayesian analysis, it happens that, you know, that return period was a little bit low, uh, much lower than uh, 200 years. So then those events could be more uh, frequent than you think. And then when we were telling that to the community, you know, they were, uh, uh, very hes hesitant to believe that that could happen again. And, and, and then, you know, when you look at the history uh, and you go back to, to the 1900s and then you look at other uh, sources of information, you realize that we had these events before. The problem is we didn't have the people living there. Uh, so then, uh, that is uh, an example of what you were talking about. So, you know, trying to uh, communicate to the population that these events are not really rare. You know, they, they are, you know, of course, uh, extraordinary in the sense that uh, they were, I mean, the, the damage associated to them was very large, but, you know, the uh, historical records uh, demonstrate that they had happened before uh, the problem is you didn't have population living there. There was an inhabited area, but now we have a, a, a infrastructure, people, and so on. So it was uh, uh, trying to integrate uh, the uh, community leaders and the community itself to understand that. That was a very challenging activity, and but uh, very nice. <laughs> and, and really what, what happened in, in Vargas, mm -hmm. that was really catastrophic. About almost, I think, about 50,000 people died. And the whole town of San Bernardino, I think it's called, completely destroyed and doesn't exist anymore. And that makes me think of what you said. Was, it makes me think about history. And the history of humankind could be described as the, or the human's inability to learn from past mistakes. 
And Mr. Artiman here, he's really passionate about climate change, and he really wants to create solutions to do that. And I, I know that you were president of a couple organizations, and you're really involved in, in ways to work on, on climate change. How do we avoid from, 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 from that happening? Because climate change mm -hmm. is happening, and you have the data, but how do we actually make people believe and learn from the mistakes so we can avoid catastrophic events? Yeah, well, you, you will not really avoid the catastrophic events, but you can uh, uh, adapt. Okay, so then I, I think the key issue here is adaptation. So then uh, we, we have to face it, you know, we, we have a problem. Uh, uh, climate is going to be uh, uh, more variable. Uh, we are probably going to have more uh, frequent stream events in the future. Uh, you know, we are going to have in some areas uh, 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 winter storms or uh, coastal storms are going to be more frequent. Uh, uh, in some other areas, maybe we're going to have more drought. Uh, so then the thing is, uh, the key issue there is we cannot avoid those uh, 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 hazards to happen because they have happened all the time, you know, as uh, part of, of the uh, uh, earth systems. Uh, so then the thing is, uh, what might change is the frequency of the events, the intensity of the events, but then uh, people is still going to be living in any the given area. So then the key issue here is how we adapt and what kind of measures uh, we need to implement, uh, or governments, or local, uh, or, or, or local uh, pol policy makers. Or, uh, for example, you know, in, in Vargas, we have uh, a very, very long list of, of mistakes of uh, how we should not do things. <laughs> okay, so but but you can have you, you can you have such kind of examples in, in, in many different locations around the world. Uh, and then, you know, what happens is that uh, people was uh, evacuated and um, forbidden to go to the places where the event happened, but then ultimately people go back because, you know, it's, it's their roots, their area. But then, you know, what, what the local governments are going to be doing, I mean, they need to be uh, uh, just uh, uh, making people think about what uh, what are their, their uh, you know, their uh, hazards and, uh, and their exposures and, and, and how do they need to act in, in case of something happening. So then that's, part, that's, for example, part of an adaptation policy. You know, besides, of course, uh, something called uh, more physical adaptation, like, for example, building a proper infrastructure to be able to prevent uh, uh, you know, a flood or, you know, just uh, so that you build a channel or uh, some kind of uh, 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 protection uh, for the population. That's uh, one uh, kind of adaptation. But then the other ad adaptation is uh, how to uh, uh, make people uh, conscious about uh, that these events could happen again and, and you know, what, uh, what is the danger for them and for their families. Okay, so then uh, I think key in climate change is adaptation. And, and that is a big, big task for uh, local governments, uh, 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 country governments uh, worldwide. So um, there are many initiatives uh, going on, but I, I don't know exactly uh, you know, whether uh, the population is really uh, well aware of, of what they can and cannot do. Uh, or what they should and should not do. So I think uh, you need to really work with uh, the communities. Uh, it's a very, it's a global problem, but it's a local solution. I, I completely agree with you, um, with what you said, like it, it's a local solution at the end of the day, because um, as you said, adaptation is the key. Um, uh, like climate change is gonna affect every place very differently. So you're gonna have to take very different measures to get resilient to its effects. So um, I would say from your experience working with communities, <clears throat> excuse me, 
how, how, how do you think we can improve sending the message across to the communities in terms of climate change? Or how can we better convince them about this upcoming danger? Yeah, well, you, you, you always have, you know, depending on, on, on the different uh, organizations, how people get organized. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in, in, if you are in a urban area, uh, uh, normally you have some uh, council or uh, local government that uh, is more in touch with uh, the communities there. So I think, you know, you have to start from this very, very local uh, um, I uh, structures, I mean, governmental or organizational structures. And uh, there should be uh, some kind of, you know, uh, think tank or uh, just implemented at a very local scale uh, to be able to uh, do this uh, more educational and uh, uh, just giving information about, you know, what's, what's for example, this week here uh, is the uh, Extreme Events Weeks in Champagne, uh, and then the, the local, uh, I mean, the local uh, 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 organization that is in charge of the uh, security of the uh, of the community security here uh, they, you know they have this um, you know they use the, the, the uh, local networks uh, you know uh, 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 social networks and, and uh, Instagram or whatever to send messages or even the next door application to send uh, messages to, to the community. And then, you know, they, the message, uh, you know, you can read it, it's, it's, it's available on the web. And, and I, I like it very much because uh, the message is, uh, you know, if you have a warning, for example, uh, from a, a winter storm or a big storm coming, uh, please pay attention to it. Because even if you don't have, a, let's say, a tornado uh, warning, coming but uh, a big storm can be still very damaging and and then you have to pay attention to that so it takes a, a, a lot of effort to uh, make people understand uh, that this this is their security and uh, so then it is it's a, it's a big task from the, the local governments and the local organizations to be in touch with the communities. And now we have many different um, uh, channels, uh, communication channels. For example, the next door application is great because you know you know what's going on, and and you know use things like that because uh, this is what people is reading. You know, you you you, you have uh, your cell phones all day, and and you you have this. Uh, uh, you know, this uh, a very nice technology uh, to, to have information there. So they, I think that that's uh, something that can be, can be used for, for uh, that kind of purposes, for example, uh, just to send a message. And it has to be, you know, like it, it doesn't need to, I mean, it's not something that you're going to do like once every three years. No, no, you have to do it every year, <laughs> you know, like be, because people forget. You know, it, uh, I mean, it's amazing, but you know, we humans are not thinking about it all the time. But you know, you have to remind people. It, it's just uh, uh, something very, you have to be very, very consistent and uh, uh, just uh, very patient because, uh, you know, people, uh, it's, that's a way of, of learning. So I think that, 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 that would, that, that is, you know, what I, of what I've seen, uh, this is what really works if you are just, uh, you know, very, very consistent and, and repeat those kind of messages. Mm -hmm. It's a global problem, a local solution. Yep. <laughs> something to really think about and ponder about because we are, sometimes we think that we're waiting for someone to do something for us. But in reality, it's up to us, little by little to, until we create ripple effects and mm -hmm. we actually are solved problems you know to, to end we usually we, we have this fun section that we call overrated underrated so the first question that I wanted to ask is statistics majors you study math mathematics and then you decided and went to do statistics 
would you have changed if you if you were to do like would you have considered doing statistics first and then mathematics or would you would you have never done mathematics but in general is statistics overrated or underrated as a major um well, um, if you well thinking about the first, I mean the first question uh, that you were asking whether uh, I would had uh, selected a statistic first instead of math. No, uh, I, I was very very happy to select math first. You know, it's uh, uh, you know you can for example uh, you can be a dancer, okay, uh, and be a great dancer, but I mean if you are for example. Uh, you do ballet first, and then you do classical ballet. Then you can be a dancer, but the opposite is not <laughs> true. You know, uh, it's, it's very hard after a lifetime of being a dancer, being a classical ballet dancer, because you know that's a, a more fine technique, maybe, and then you don't have all the tools. You know, maybe you get older and you cannot do it. Uh, so then it is better, I mean, uh, I'm, in my understanding, it is uh, always you feel uh, a, a more secure, having a better grounding of your knowledge, uh, and just feeling secure that you have the real or uh, the good math uh, as a, uh, your support. It doesn't mean that you cannot, of course, do be a great uh, data scientist and a statistician, even if you don't have a math degree. So that doesn't, I don't mean that, okay? I just mean that you feel uh, secure because you know what's going on in, in the background, okay? Uh, and then, but you don't need to know everything that is going in the, on in the background to really uh, do things uh, or make things to work. So then I think uh, a, uh, a stats major uh, is going to be uh, a certain, uh, uh, a very big uh, va uh, added value to your career because uh, you will have uh, some tools that uh, other majors are not going to have. And, uh, and then, you know, whenever, uh, and as I said, you know, you, you will have that uh, kind of resources that you learn, but then uh, the rest is to learn the problem. Okay, so, so then have these other, which is something that maybe you can uh, learn by yourself in, in, a, in an easier way, is you talk uh, with uh, the experts in the field, uh, uh, you know, long enough and deep enough to understand the problem, but then if you have the tools to, to handle the, the data and, and, and propose the models for the data, uh, then uh, you will be having, you know, like a, a value added to, to your uh, degree, I think. Okay, but, but I mean, in my case, uh, you know, if you look back, uh, uh, I think I wouldn't change that order uh, just because you feel more comfortable. Basically, it's that, you know, it's, it's just a way of uh, how you feel, uh, you know, because you, you, you understand there is a machinery there that you need to, you know, it's, it's nice to, to be able to understand, uh, you know, things happening in the background. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you have a background in uh, studying the environment and the climate, so I would ask, what do you think of the Paris Climate Agreement? Would you say it's overrated or underrated? Uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, in my case, I mean, I, I think it is a great effort. Uh, I mean, as I said, you know, it's a global problem. So it, it, it's, it's a, of course, it's, 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 it's the way to go. You know, since it's a global problem, you need to have uh, an agreement like that because otherwise it is, it's something that is not going to work. I mean, it's, uh, if you don't have this uh, uh, worldwide uh, compromise on, on, on what the different countries are going to do or are, or are able to do, okay? But uh, uh, I would think that, again, uh, having these goals that are so, um, uh, general, like for example, trying to th uh, think about that the temperature is, uh, you know, is, is, is not going to be rising more than 
two degrees Fahrenheit on uh, sorry two degrees centigrade on average. So then th having this this threshold uh, is not having any meaning really. Exactly. Okay, because you know what does it mean to have uh, not a uh, 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 temperature rise not greater than two degrees centigrade on average? You know, on average, you're talking about uh, on average worldwide. Uh, so, you know, having ocean, land, combination of the two in a single number. So that's why it is locally what you, under, you need to understand. So then uh, there is a, a different view that you might have is that, uh, for example, in, in a particular location, uh, what had happened in the history? Do you have information to tell you, for example, whether uh, you know uh, rainfall has been uh, much higher on average than in the last past ten years, or lower than average than in the last past ten years? So then uh, you need to uh, really, again, uh, that, that's where you want to see things locally and then uh, adapt uh, locally of what does it mean to have uh, an event of this size or a particular location that maybe is close to a river or a big river or has uh, different hydrology or geomorphology or uh, different uh, topography or uh, different uh, urban structure. So then uh, that's why you need the local information and, and then see, you know, locally, how, how is this going to affect us? So then, on general, having these uh, uh, thresholds, it, it is okay, but then it's not going to solve the problem locally. So I, I applaud that, of course, it's, it's, it's the way to go. And, uh, it, it, but it needs to be uh, reviewed uh, often, and it needs to have uh, it, it needs to really have a, 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 an important compromise of the different countries, and uh, you know it, then you have other uh, factors like the economy mm -hmm. and uh, population growth and and, and uh, every other. Uh, problem that we are facing this nowadays that you know you have to take into consideration. What about the Green New Deal? What are you what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think uh, you know again uh, this is this these are uh, excellent efforts. Right. Uh, I think that this is what um, you know this is the way to go in the sense that you know we need to have this this sort of agreements and uh, uh, and and there, there, uh, we have to have a compromise of the different countries in, in, in doing that, in, in sitting in a same table and, and proposing uh, those deals. Uh, okay, but then uh, how you take those deals to the different uh, country situations? And uh, uh, what, are, what are the uh, sacrifices that uh, a particular country has to do in order to be able to meet that compromise, you know, on how much uh, that is going to affect that particular country, uh, depending on, you know, what is the situation of, of the population. For example, poverty levels, uh, um, inequality levels, and, and economical uh, situation. Uh, population growth and so on. So then, uh, again, you need to translate all these deals into a more realistic uh, situation uh, locally mm. or country-wise. And then uh, uh, it, it takes a, a, a big effort. So that's why I say, you know, you need really a task force to be able to implement that in, in, in the different countries. And, and every country should have uh, a task force that uh, is going to be dedicated just to uh, bring those deals worldwide to the local situation. And the last question we're going to ask mm -hmm. is about, of course, our beloved country of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So you and I are both Venezuelan immigrants. Mm -hmm. Venezuelan immigration. Mm -hmm. Overrated or underrated? Uh, under. <laughs> 
because um, uh, I actually uh, wrote an article about that uh, not long ago, and uh, uh, because uh, you know, I think you have we have not, or or you know, what you see is that uh, this very complex geopolitical problem has not been. Um, uh, consider in, in all its dimension. Uh, so then uh, the impacts of uh, our situation into, for example, uh, the remaining South American countries, you know, how this has affected the different countries, not only, you know, having to, for example, thinking about Colombia, having to uh, uh, receive all this volume of uh, people that uh, has different needs and how is that impacting uh, the same, I mean, that country, for example, on their services and everything. So then I think there, there are many, many uh, different views of the problem and I don't think all of them have been considered uh, in, a, in a comprehensive way. So that's why I think it is an underrated problem because uh, there, there is a lot to, of course, you know, this is something that uh, would be more mostly of a social scientist uh, uh, efforts, but I, I'm sure there are many, many uh, very nice experts, uh, you know, working on that problem. And I, I know many of them already that are working on that problem. But, you know, from the statistical point of view, it looks like, you know, it's only numbers. But in this case, it's not only numbers, it's all the impacts. And it's a cascade of impacts that are happening and are not being uh, properly understood, I think. Or, or, or maybe we need more time to, to understand those, those uh, uh, you know, cascading problems that are happening. Like that would be such, such an interesting question to research <laughs> because of the also like negative impacts, but also the positive impacts. Uh, like for example, a high skill like immigration uh, mm -hmm. of certain countries. Mm -hmm. Do you ever plan to like, you know, assuming everything is fixed in the country, which many problems, but assuming everything is fixed mm -hmm. somehow, mm -hmm. would you ever want to go back? Yes, of course I want to go back. I, I don't say at this point if I want to go back to leave, but I want to, uh, uh, any, any contribution that I uh, is, is on my hands, like for example, uh, you know, in my, in my case is education. You know, this is uh, my passion. So if I, you know, somebody asks me, oh, we want to do something about, you know, teach a class or something like that, I would be happy to do it or, or you know, try to solve a problem or, or propose a solution or, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, so, so in that case, yes, the, the answer is yes. I, I'm not saying that maybe I want to go, uh, or maybe I don't have the opportunity to, to go back and live back again there, but, you know, but then uh, you can always work in the different problems, which are going to be <laughs> very many to be solved, so we can always contribute. I think that's something that I'll be very excited about when it happens to find ways to rebuild our, our beautiful country and, and make it what it was at one point. But thank you very, very much for coming in and talking to us and teaching us so many lessons about statistics, climate change, and even things like how climate change is a global problem that gets fixed locally. Thank, Thank you, you guys, and uh, well, I applaud your uh, initiative. This is a great initiative. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, well, keep doing what you're doing. It was a pleasure. <laughs> we'll try. All right, so if you have any questions for Dr. Bravo, please write these comments uh, down below, and we will also put her personal website and university website down below as well. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.